with the right uh, with the right window. Okay. And we'll work three on this. And go ahead here uh, to the first um, uh, topic. Now, what this contains, if you have any uh, students that you're uh, worried about their knowledge of trigonometry, or if you have sons and daughters that might be uh, learning it for the first time, uh, this is an example of learning to sin uh, early, uh, in particular uh, pushing a button on a calculator uh, that has uh, the word sin uh, sitting right there. So the construction that we're going to do today is just a review of trigonometry. And that's kind of neat, but it's kind of a weird review, and it's a review that takes advantage of the geometry. All the stuff we're talking about here has mostly uh, to do with uh, triangles and sines and cosines. All of these things are single buttons on a modern calculator, and a calculator will be allowed for the class, but you don't need it. Uh, geometry takes care of it most of the time. In any case, all of those functions, uh, if looked at in a little slightly different way, uh, lead to the basic uh, framework of relativity, and that's what we'll do today, and uh, quantum theory, uh, which we'll be taking up for the rest of the lectures, as well as additional relativistic things. So, uh, these uh, uh, ideas are actually the ones we're going to use are going to be the hyperbolic uh, uh, trigonometric functions for today, but you can use for uh, uh, you can also use the circular ones. Just to get you started on the idea of, of that is that the uh, hyperbolic functions are going to be a function of the logarithm of the Doppler shift in relativity and the circular functions are going to be a function of what's called the stellar aberration angle. If you've taken a little bit of relativity you know what that is but we're going to talk about that uh, later on. In any case the one difference between this and the standard approach uh, to trigonometry is we're not interested in angles. Angles don't mean much in space and time, but area does. So these are all um, areas. The areas indicated in orange here are the actual arguments of the uh, three trigonometric, ordinary trigonometric, circular trigonometric functions. And you can play with uh, all of this geometry that goes with this uh, using the applications that are uh, hyperlinked. Uh, on the corners of most of these slides. But the basic idea is that physics of relativity, simple trigonomo trigonometry of optical wave interference, or just electromagnetic wave interference. And that then falls right into a developing uh, quantum theory. So there's a whole picture of the uh, circular functions and the uh, trigonometric hyperbolic functions, the functions of rho, which we're going to be defining early on uh, today. And um, the idea, of course, is that uh, the area that is swept out by a radius vector on the hyperbola, that will be the rho uh, function. The sigma will be something else. So you'll have hyperbolic functions of rho that match with the circular functions of the stellar angle sigma. And um, the sine will go with a hyperbolic tangent. The tangent will go with a hyperbolic sine. That's nice. I've never seen this studied anywhere in uh, any book that I have. It, it's really so cool that it makes things uh, really easy and uh, is worth learning. So that's uh, what I, I'm doing, just selling that. And uh, this is the whole pile of them all together. Now the, uh, the little diagram that you have on the back of the textbook, the notebook, uh, is basically this. But it uh, will have other names like Hamiltonian, relativistic Hamiltonian, the Broglie wavelength, uh, all that kind of stuff uh, is what we're going to develop today. We're going to start developing that. Uh, we'll do the quantum mechanics uh, uh, assignments later uh, on. So. Let's just mention that uh, if you're going to be using hyperbolic trigonometry, it's actually simpler as far as al algebra goes because there are no complex numbers needed uh, for that. But when you go to use uh, the next 
uh, part of our uh, trigonometric exercise, then you do have to do what we've talked about in uh, chapter 10 of the review unit. So there are basically two uh, relationships that are the same relationship except for i's and plus and minus ones. And th that's the exponential with an i in it. And then there's the exponential with a row uh, in it. Uh, <clears throat> and this is actually a typo right there. That should be a row. Uh, e to the minus row is the difference between cosh and cinch, whereas the e to the minus uh, thing that we use in uh, the wave frequency uh, amplitude and phase of quantum mechanics is the cosine minus i sine. We almost always have that minus sign there, you remember, because of the way phasers go. They go left-handed. And we're going to make use of that, too. So uh, all of this uh, is uh, fine. Now here is uh, basically, in a nutshell, what goes on with relativity, what we call uh, phase invariance or gauge invariance in all of high energy physics, low energy physics, practically no energy physics. This is really important. And the idea of uh, showing phasers, now these phasers are turned on the side, the real axis points up so that it matches the actual transverse wave function, uh, basic real wave right there. And then a quarter cycle ahead is the imaginary part of this wave function. Uh, and that's a joke for business people that imagination precedes reality by exactly what quarter. It's the way uh, Bell Labs went out of business. And uh, uh, when they were told they had to get every one of their research projects for the market in uh, a few months. In any case, uh, that aside, the idea is that this picture imagines that every point in fact, you think every pixel on that screen, and even finer than that, there's a phaser uh, there that's giving you a reading on a clock. And the idea is we have really two extremes here. Uh, here, clock velocity uh, is zero. Uh, that is, I'm laying these clocks down in a particular frame and having them go so that they read the phase of the wave at every point in space and time. And the, the idea of phase velocity is how fast does a particular phase go uh, in that um, uh, diagram of space versus time. And um, that's a Minkowski uh, graph when you draw the time axis up. Some of our simulations have it down. That's more like a Newtonian graph that's been turned on its side. In any case, the other a possibility uh, is that if you had the clocks all actually moving uh, very close to the speed of light, their frequency would be very close to zero. But it would give the same result. The phases everywhere would be the same. And that's true for anything in between that, half the speed of light, a quarter the speed of light. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. This is the idea of gauge invariance, which will We'll prove that other ways, but it should, it, it, this is a mind-twisting idea that very few people uh, uh, use to, to or show or talk about. So uh, I thought I should put it at the beginning uh, where it's very mystical, but we'll be proving that it has to be, and that is really powerful. Okay, now, one of the things I'm going to do now is finish go through in piece by piece the basic idea of per space time versus sp space time, which is Herman Minkowski uh, 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 invention. And uh, Herman Minkowski was a real academic star at Swiss Tech in the late 1800s. And he was Einstein's mass physics teacher. And he made Einstein mad by uh, calling him out for being a lazy dog or something like that. And when Einstein, a few years later, discovered relativity, Herman had also done the same thing, almost, but he'd done it graphically. And the graphs that we're going to produce by waves are Minkowski graphs. And he was very excited to have Einstein look at that and say, look, you can explain relativity so that it isn't so mysterious by the graph. 
And Einstein didn't even answer his letter. He didn't have anything to do with it. This is a case of uh, one race, the German, feeling superior to somebody who has a Polish name. Okay? It's a tragedy. A tragedy because he went ahead and published and then died very shortly after that of, of, of a disease that no one really even knew what it was. So um, there's this, this history and there's people behind all of this stuff and it's worth knowing about that. In any case, let's get the thing uh, started just very simply. The, the idea of a per space time, that is a, a, what I call the keyboard of the gods. Now what we're uh, really dealing with here is something that came uh, even before all of this, and that's uh, the, the, the Napoleon star, um, well, mathematician physicist, but then he was actually in the army doing all of the nasty things that Napoleon did and finally got him uh, um, <clears throat> in water, the old Battle of Waterloo and they sent him to an island on the other side of the world to live out his life. So th th that's a sad story too, but Fourier was an incredible genius for v developing this idea, although it's not quite what he had in mind. I'm thinking of this as a keyboard of the gods. That is, I, I can pick the frequency by pushing buttons like I can on a piano or on a flute or some musical instrument. So I get a note by pushing this button, I get another one, and I get them at whatever frequency I want. So this is a keyboard because you can make uh, ultraviolet frequencies, you can make infrasonic frequencies, they're all there, but they're here too because I can also, by pushing the right button on this thing, make the wavelength, that is the wave number, which is inverse wavelength, I can make that under my control. So this really is the idea of Fourier space. So we're going to be building a lattice in space-time, which is Minkowski lattice, but at the same time we're going to be building one in per space-time that looks the same. It's the uh, crystalline lattice and then the inverse lattice that goes with uh, your X-ray uh, measurements and your descriptions of band theory and stuff like that, you see. It's just that this is space and time, not just space and space and space. Okay? So we're really dealing with four dimensions. We're just taking two of them uh, to, to, uh, in what we're doing here today, which makes it possible to use uh, rulers and compasses to derive the things. But any of the ideas, if I push the button right there, that key right there, what I get is a certain uh, wave of a certain period or inverse frequency. So this in space time has a wave going this way in time, while it also makes one uh, going that way in space. Now the one that's going in time has a name, uh, at least the units have a name, the inverse second is called a Hertz, after Heinrich Hertz, who was born in 1857, uh, didn't live uh, very long compared to the other fellow that took care of this axis, the one that gives you the so-called K vector. And that's uh, coming up here. But in any case, the letter tau, the Greek letter tau, is what we're going to use most of the time when we're just talking about the raw period. And uh, this is uh, key uh, for time, what we're talking about. Uh, this is the time. This is what we're uh, measuring uh, over in inverse space, is the inverse time, that is the frequency. So this is a particular example of frequency four-fifths has a period of five fours, that's the inverse, and then uh, while you're doing that, while you're pushing that key way over here, you're, per you're taking a particular wave number, the number of waves per meter. So this is waves per second, this is waves per meter, okay, so that's going to produce something over here with a given wavelength, which is the inverse of that kappa, Greek kappa uh, there, uh, that, that um, we use to take care of of all three dimensions of space uh, have kappas and k's associated with them. And who thought that up? Well, it's Mr. Heinrich Kaiser, born almost the same time as Heinrich Hertz, but he lived all the way to 1940. So apparently it, you live longer by working in space and time. He's too rushed or something. Anyway, bad joke. Uh, the idea of a Kaiser or kinks in a wave in, in space, okay, that's another way to remember the K, but in any case, I do believe that the K comes from Kaiser. He's an excellent physicist in terms of solar spectroscopy, his first one to really do it. And so that uh, gives us um, 
the inverse of that kappa gives us the wavelength. Okay, meters per wave instead of waves per meter. Okay, so that's the basic idea. You've got a vector here uh, representing a point uh, in space-time associated with a particular uh, thing that's going on. When I push just one button here, I cover this space with a wave that has these uh, numbers. That is, I make a thing uh, that is called a continuous wave, a single wave, a 1CW. That's the uh, uh, jo laser jocks terminology there. So uh, the idea is that it is continuous. It continues everywhere and for all time. So literally, you cover the whole universe by pushing this button. I told you this was the keyboard of the gods, didn't I? Okay. So we're, we're making the mathematical fictions here. That this is a, uh, has a, uh, a complete uncertainty, total, infinite uncertainty in space and time. And it's one point right here. Now you start to spread that point a little bit and you bring this guy into something that's more like what we deal with in real life. And anyway, uh, what we need to do is understand the waves from these parameters. Wave frequency nu, wave number kappa, and then inverses of those, wave period tau, and wavelength lambda. Okay, distance from uh, peak to peak, or trough to trough, or slope one to slope one. Neg neglecting slope minus one. All right? Okay, well, uh, the thing that's important about that is the wave velocity formulas. All you have to do is look at the ratio of the lambda, that space, to the time, that's the period, and you've got the velocity. No problem there. But we also would like to be able to use these quantities to uh, characterize the velocity. Okay, so when I have a particular lambda equal two-thirds and I have a particular tau five-fourths, and this is all stuff you can play with on an app that goes with this uh, graph here, but um, this is a particular example of a fraction, eight-fifteenths meters per second. And um, that uh, is uh, nice. If you're going to teach this stuff, it really makes sense for relativity uh, to use numbers that are rational fractions because then you don't really have to even go to the calculator most of the time to work things out. In any case, uh, the other thing that you should realize is that this uh, lambda being 1 over kappa and this tau being 1 over nu, you flip that around and you get frequency over, that's per, uh, the, the, the per time over per space. That gives you the ratio of space over time, uh, which is the velocity that you're interested in. So that's uh, what you're going to have in this space up here. We're going to be looking at the slope uh, of this uh, guy here uh, for velocity, just as we move uh, in uh, space through time. Uh, we're going to be doing a similar thing with other waves that are combinations, but right now, like I said, this one dot here has a certain slope that's refer referencing the velocity of just one wave, one CW. Okay? Now let's see if there's anything else I need to say here. I think that is pretty much the idea. Same thing I said before, but you also will be, in order for these uh, uh, trigonometric functions to work for us, uh, we're going to be needing to put a 2 pi on the frequency and the kappa, both. And when you do that, the Greek letters change, and you're more familiar with the omega. We've been using that a lot, and the, we didn't use the k so much except for the last few examples. But in any case, omega over k is the uh, uh, basic formula for velocity that we'll be looking at. Now, we'll also be interested in d omega dk. It's called group velocity. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, we're about to get there. Okay, let's see if there's anything um, else that I can say about this. I'm going to try to keep this guy up with that. There are the wave velocity formulas there. Wave speed equals slope to vertical in the uh, space-time graph. But it's the slope to horizontal in the new k. That's going to be important as we go back and forth between per space time and space time. And that's the secret to making relativity simple, is to let the waves tell you what they're doing. Now there's one other phenomenon here that comes up um, in not too different time. Uh, 1803 to 1853 we have Christian Doppler. Now he's working with train whistles 
the, a train passing you going, meow. But if you, in the United States, if you hitchhike, you hear that a lot. Meow. Meow. Right? That's Doppler. Okay? And it, it also means you didn't get a ride. So this is an example with just any way, but I'm going to be dealing with light, so I'm going to be interested in colors uh, and how I get them. And the basic idea is if I have a wave like the one we just were fooling with uh, on, uh, in, in uh, a space-time, this is the wave length that we're talking about here, and, and uh, we're looking at the wave moving in time, as it has to, uh, and uh, asking how often do I get hit by a crest of that wave. Okay, so I get hit, 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 hit. Now let's suppose uh, I start uh, to move. Let's say I move uh, this way with the wave. Well, it's hit, and I wait a while, and it's a longer time hit, and so on. So if I run away from a oh, with a wave, I can't run away from it. This is light. Uh, uh, we will uh, uh, see a reduced frequency, which means I will go from green to red. Right being rough here, okay? But if I go the other way, it's whap, 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 I get hit uh, much more often. So this graph is enough to give us a feeling for what's going to happen uh, with light. If you move fast enough this way, the wave gets redder and redder. What's that mean? It drops out of the visible into the infrared, and finally into radio, and so forth. And while that's happening, and that actually happens exponentially, it's something people don't realize, uh, it, it dies. Its amplitude also Doppler shifts down. Because amplitude turns out to be frequency in this quantum business. But we'll get to that. The idea that this thing gets redder and redder until the wave dies is, is very important. So if I run up to this thing, it's where'd it go? It's gone. Right? If I can run that fast. Okay? As I approach the speed of light. Move fast enough the other way, you die. If you have the same speed that dot killed this one, this one's going to kill you because it's going to turn into gamma radiation and the super hyper gamma radiation. It's just going to fry everything that makes you up. Okay, so these are two extremes of Doppler shift. What about the amplitude? Mm -hmm. And the amplitude has grown exponentially. Thank you. <laughs> okay? All right, that's the basic uh, stuff that we have to deal with here. Okay? Now, before we do that, though, we have to deal with something that really bothered the heck out of Galileo. And that was the idea, um, well, he never really got to talk about it, but he might have thought about it. But the idea, after relativity was established in 1905, the whole idea of C being so constant is really a, a mind bender. And now, I used to make jokes about this. I couldn't explain it uh, when I was teaching relativity. I couldn't explain. Uh, I just I, I, what I did was I said it's like the Roadrunner cartoons. The light is the Roadrunner. Meep meep. And no matter what the coyote buys from Acme Corporation, how many people know these cartoons? Not very many. How no matter if he buys a rocket-powered skateboard and goes it really fast, it's still meep meep. Same speed for the Roadrunner. Okay. Well, that doesn't really explain why. What I'm trying to do here is explain why that's true. So now I'm making up an um, Alice Bob scenario. That's what all the quantum optics uh, papers and texts use. They have Alice and Bob. Very seldom do they have a Carla, which we're, we're going to need. We really need three to play this game. But in any case, the basic idea of Alice and Bob is point A and point B. Okay, that's what they're really good. I'm just trying to dress it up a little bit. So we'll do that. Here's Alice. She's kind of cute. This guy's a, a little bit cute himself. And uh, we're asking here for a scenario in which Alice uh, is, say, maybe a million meters away from Bob. They, he, she's got a spaceship. He's just uh, doing some astronomy out there in the, in the hinterlands of the galaxy somewhere. And they talk to each other on their uh, fancy cell phones. And uh, Alice has a 600 terahertz laser going. And it gets to uh, Bob fairly quickly, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. 
and he has a really sensitive receiver that gives him the frequency in digital form. And so she calls him up and says, what do you got, Bob? And uh, Bob says, oh, it's your beautiful, beautiful green, uh, 600 terrors, 600 points. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He's getting nine figures, okay? So Alice says, okay, uh, I'm going to do something, and you see if something happens, and I'll call you later. So what she does is she gets her spacecraft going toward Bob, and she gets up to a speed that's fast enough to make it so that she can, has to detune all the way to 300 terahertz in order to keep him seeing 600. So that's her trick. That's her, she's got this really snazzy uh, spacecraft laser system where she can fool Bob into thinking she hasn't left home. She hasn't moved. She, he still sees 600 terahertz. Now he has to adjust the amp. She has to adjust the amplitude too, in order to make this work. Otherwise, he's going to see some intensity changes. But uh, aside from that, she calls him up. What do you got? Oh, it's still your beautiful blue green, 600. It's a beautiful color. I've marked it on the on the spectrum on the wall there. It's what you get in the Mediterranean. And you get a, a swimming pool. It's got a white bottom. It's going to make this blue green. This is not blue green. This is just spinach green. But uh, Give me a break. Anyway, as Alice's laser approaches Bob, he sees 600 terahertz because she's done this thing, uh, the Doppler, undoppler it. And the question is, she gets him, what lambda, what uh, 1 over kappa does Bob measure? That's a separate uh, reading to, to do that, the fraction grading or something like that. This is a time measurement here. Space measurement, different. Maybe uh, something weird going on. And the question is, is he seeing a, a phony green? This thing is produced by 300 terrors coming at him, okay? Is there something phony about that light? How many kinds of green are there in the vacuum of the universe? And that's the same thing about every other color. How many ways can the universe put out 600 terahertz or hold it in its uh, 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 thing? That's, that's really what we're after here. So we're going to plot this terahertz versus, well, kappa, but uh, that's inverse wavelength, okay? Uh, and the question is, somewhere on this line has got to be the 600 terahertz that Alice is giving him. And the question is, could it be here or here or here? How many kinds of this color are there, okay? Now, if it's a really complicated piece of glass, there may be several modes that will carry 600 terahertz. But the vacuum, it's a lot simpler. And the whole idea here is years of spectroscopy rule out any phony 600 terahertz. It's got to be on the light line. It's got to be on the line omega equals CK. And that's pretty... Uh, to have that not be true of the vacuum is a disaster. Because if you have two kinds of green, then you can get four kinds, and you can get 16 kinds, and pretty soon you're up there fetlocks in all kinds of different green. That's got to be just one. And that means there's got to be just one speed for the green. Because when I bring it up this way, the omega over CK uh, gets bigger, bigger slope, and then if I go out here, it's going to go slower. Okay, so that's the basic idea of this. And it, it's only possible to have that particular, uh, in this case, we're talking about a velocity of 3 times 10 to the 8. Well, it's, this is 9 figures. This is without a plus or minus. Now, this is Ken Evans, and I talked about him uh, before. Uh, now, now, the other thing that's true about this, this is a logical derivation to get rid of their roadrunner crap. But the basic idea is that this light has all of these colors do that. None of them can be uh, uh, free of this. What has to be free of uh, uh, is dispersion. When this uh, thing here, which is uh, called the dispersion line, turns into a curve, that means you've got a solid or something crazy going on. And you've got uh, something that's a Fourier transform if it's Hamiltonian. This one's uh, just a straight line. And if we didn't have this, forget optical astronomy. Imagine what it would be if you have this galaxy exploding, putting out all kinds of colors. We've got a couple of images of these things, right? And if you ask yourself, 
what happens if blue is even 0.0001% faster or slower than red? What would you see? Well, the, 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 these things are coming out several billion uh, light years, right? So here goes the blue, and pretty soon the blue is ahead of the red, right? And certainly by the time it gets here, a billion years later, it's way ahead of the red. And so are all the other colors in different places. So what do you see? Nothing. You see a smear of color coming from every direction. That's what would happen if you even went for, broke that speed limit of C, the tiniest amount. Make sense? Yeah, better. Okay, so what we're going to do is find a way to measure that speed that really is convenient. And this is the rapidity uh, idea. The logarithm of the Doppler shift. Turns out to make Galileo, it took me a long time to find a picture of Galileo where he wasn't frowning or looking really angry. I mean, somebody must have mistreated him. Church sir did. He's smiling there. And I said that his revenge is that rapidity obeys his law. You just add rapidity uh, to get the answer. Now, what's rapidity? Doppler ratio, receiver over source. That's the way to find it. You can use direct notation. Uh, there's the thing that starts it. There's the thing that reads it. Okay? And the logarithm of that ratio, I'll call rho. Rho, source, receiver, wherever they are. Okay? So, this little guy here is e to the rho, right? Now, that's e to the minus rho go the other way. That, that is important. But here, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the Doppler uh, ratios that are seen by each of these observers. And here's where I need Carla. Carla's picking up a 400 terahertz because she's running away. Uh, but she's not running faster than... Uh, uh, Alice, she's going a little slower than Alice, so she's got frequency a little higher than what Alice is uh, putting out. And uh, here is Bob just standing still, still getting a 600 terahertz from her. Okay, so basically we're looking at um, Alice as a source and Bob as a receiver, and we're seeing 600 over 300, the ratio of these two readings, two to one for him. Okay. And then the Bob Alice rapidity, if you were to flip uh, the, the, this, uh, uh, put this thing as a, as a uh, logarithm of that ratio, it is uh, 0.69. Okay, so this is getting used to rapidities. And uh, you flip this, you, you, you change the uh, sign, that is you uh, have a minus sign here, so what you get is a logarithm here that has a minus sign. And then we go do the same thing with uh, uh, Carla. And Alice. Now the question is, uh, she's going to ask, uh, what, um, what's the, what does uh, Carla see for Bob, or Bob see for Carla? Okay, and that's where you put these together: the Carla-Bob Doppler ratio, uh, right here, and the Carla-Bob rapidity, which is the logarithm of that. And you, when you put this thing in an exponent, it adds. So basically, you see an adding of frames if you use rapidity. So Carla's Bob plus the rapidity of Bob Alice, that's going to give you the Carla Alice uh, 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 relationship. That's this one right here. Okay? So that's cool. That's what makes Galileo, if he were still alive, really happy. Because he, rapidity is very convenient. Now rapidity being a logarithm, you see, uh, can uh, easily make numbers for you for high energy. I mean really high energy like the uh, Hadron Collider, we consider that with four nines or five nines or six nines, 0.99999C, that's really hard to do arithmetic with. But if you use the uh, rapidity, it's about seven. They've gotten up to seven. BFD, right? <laughs> seven. Come on, nature does a lot more than that. And every time you put another number on that thing, it's a times ten. So, well, not times ten, times E, actually, because we're using it. Okay, now here's another thing I want you to point out. This makes uh, Galileo uh, happy uh, too. And that is that phasers add just like Galilean velocity, except we're talking angular velocity now. All right, so let's uh, 
go ahead here and get this one caught up. This is the picture that I would have you look at. Uh, we'll do this other ways. Uh, there's a much nicer way to talk about this than uh, drawing phasers, but we're used to adding phasers, so it's worthwhile doing. And uh, this is something that came out of our uh, really old uh, um, website, but it's, it's a huge website. It's so much stuff. We have not uh, replaced all of that with the most modern uh, things. But what I'd like to show you is the relativity of phasers. I can just draw the two of them together here, and when they're opposite each other, it's small. When they're together like they are now, it's big. So there's your beat. That's the beat between two frequencies that are uh, uh, different. The green is faster. It's going faster than the red, so it catches up with it, passes it, and then catches up with it again. So we're doing an arithmetic like that. But this is what we'll actually be doing later. This is the way we'll be looking at the things. We'll be imagining we're in the gauge frame of one of them and watching the other one spin around the nose of the first one, making it big and then small. So that's the way phasers breathe when they're together. Pretty sexy. Huh? And here's going the other way. Make the green one stands still and the other one goes backwards does the same thing. So how you look at a phaser depends on what frame you're in, but they all add Galilean style. That we're going to make big use of. Okay, now um, back here to uh, the actual thing that we need to uh, do today, and that is uh, look at what the uh, wave functions can do. And this is something that I short-circuited in the thing that I handed to you uh, today to put in the notebook under Unit 8 is a quick uh, entry into everything uh, that we're about to do. All the stuff I've said about uh, the uh, speeds and uh, road runners and whatnot, uh, that is more in a longer paper that you can also uh, pick up uh, on the front page of, of the first page of links uh, for this lecture. In any case, uh, what I want to do is talk about what happens when two waves collide. Two CWs. So this is a two CW wave. One CW coming from the uh, uh, right, okay, this guy over here, uh, and then uh, th th this guy right here, okay, is the one uh, that is going right, okay, and this one uh, going left. So um, here goes the one that goes to the right, the, and that's the, these flip, right? The, this, whenever I draw uh, these two points, and those are the first two points I want you to put on your graph. The 600 terahertz points uh, are, uh, and I'll just put a little circle around them here because they're not going to be there for long. We're going to uh, Doppler shift. Of both of them at once. But there is uh, the first base of what looks like a baseball diamond if you go ahead and finish it by adding them and making a vector up here, which we won't really need, but we can talk about it. I don't, usually don't draw it because it takes up space that we can use for other things. But in any case, that's what we're dealing with right now. And here's the magic. This is what makes this uh, whole thing possible that we're going to talk about here is that you get a wave uh, that makes uh, space-time graph paper. That is the zeros. The zeros of the real part of the wave is being plotted here. You do it with the imaginary part and you'll get one that's just off by a pi over two. But we only need one to make a graph that is going to give us Minkowski graphs. This is already a Minkowski graph, but it, Minkowski wouldn't take credit for it a piece of square graph paper, basically a chessboard. Okay? So that's what we're going to do, is we're going to Doppler shift. We're going to find out what it, an atom going really fast, or Bob going at a really fast speed through uh, this uh, field that makes this uh, square graph paper. What kind of graph paper does he see? And that's going to be the Minkowski graph. So that's what we're up for here. So let's get both of these uh, tuned onto that, and also remind you the next page in the link here shows you how to uh, play with the control panel that goes with the thing that's building the waves. And this is part of an app called Borat. 
P O H R, uh, our good old um, inventor of quantum mechanics, uh, all the funny ways that we can make are uh, available on that. So um, I'll pass that real quickly right now and just go ahead here and do the arithmetic and the graphics that's associated with adding these two uh, waves. That is the guy coming from uh, over on the right and the guy coming from over on the left uh, come together here to do an interference pattern. An interference pattern that produces a very simple thing, sophomore physics, standing wave. And the imaginary part is done with turquoise. The real part that we're interested in is a dark blue. So what we're going to do uh, in order to find the zeros of this sum is we got to factor it. And we've done this once already, but we did it pretty quickly. When we were talking about the modes, particularly the modes that gave pi over 2 all the time. But the thing I want to point out uh, right here, and that's what's going to show up as we uh, make these graphs, is we're going to find a half sum and a half difference. The half sum of these two would be, there's the full sum up at second base. The half sum is right there. It's a, uh, a vector that's pointing straight up, that is, has an infinite slope, and that's what indicates that this phase wave goes infinitely fast. And you're going to see it do that. And then this one right down here, we all know about the standing waves. That's the group part. That's the half difference of these two vectors. Uh, and Woody across the hall finished this baseball mnemonic. I, to, I had pitcher's mound, uh, right hand, uh, but first base, and then second base, third base, didn't really need names for that. But then I had grandstand, oh, I, I'm sorry, I had dugout over here, and Woody uh, said, hey, that's the, that's the grandstand. That's where you'd be if you're watching the baseball game. So anyway, the, the baseball mnemonic aside, that's uh, uh, what we uh, will be talking about here. So what we'll do first is go ahead and factor this one. Now this one is, is pretty easy to factor. And, and it's not that much more difficult than to do the next one, so we have to write down more. But basically what you're going to do here is you're going to take the R and the L, the right hand and the left hand phases. This is the right one going out to the right. This is the one coming back the other way <coughs> uh, toward the left. Um, what you do to factor these is produce a uh, half sum times a thing that has a half difference. And that cancels the left immediately. It gives us uh, uh, e to the i uh, r plus l. I'm sorry. Uh, it gives me e to the i r <coughs> uh, here. Uh, well, it gives me this back again. And then with the minus sign, it gives me this back again. Because now the r is canceled. And it gives me the L. So I end up with the uh, just the uh, uh, cosine of the half difference multiplied by a phase of half sum. So that's the rationale between the drawing the phase as the half sum, P for pitcher's mound, and then the grandstand is the half difference, R minus L. So that's nothing but cosine of kx, because when you take these phases, uh, you cancel out the time on this one, and you cancel out the spatial e to the i kx on this one. So that's the simplest example of a product of phase and group, which we are going to build a more complicated version of it. So let's leave that one on the screen and go for the more complicated one uh, that's coming up uh, here. Now, uh, I should mention, that when we do this with the L, R, and G, we're going to draw a plot on the graph uh, that indicates how it looks in per space time, the uh, inverse space time. But I should point out, if you put a whole bunch of Froyer components together and produce pulsed waves, and you can play with this on the um, simulations, uh, that's a typical simulation there for this, and we're going to uh, be showing that one as well. Um, that is uh, not too helpful, but it's fun to play with. But what we're interested in is the coherent ones that actually produce a, a spatial Excuse wave. Me. 
So this is what we've got when we Doppler shift. So we're going to ma imagine a very rapidly moving Bob who's going to Doppler shift the heck out of that uh, three, 300, I'm sorry, 600 terahertz. He's going to Doppler shift that 600 terahertz by a full octave. We have a question. Yeah. How yes. do you relate the second and the third term? Say again. How do you relate the second and the third term? Second term. Okay. And the other one. That that's this, and this is that. Yes. Yes, okay. I know that. The the one the okay. relation between now, now, that. Good question. Here's R, right? And I add it to L. Okay. So. So the K R, okay. Okay. And the K L. Cancel. Right, because this is a minus k, okay, so it's going left, it's right? So, and then the omegas, they, they uh, are left, okay, gotcha. right? <clears throat> and I have um, just e to the minus, this is over, over 2, right? So it cancels the 2 that you get from adding these two, right? Leaving me with that. And what is the definition of phase and the group uh, wave function? Well, the uh, physical definition, which we'll see, we probably ought to run the animation for this one. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'll back up on uh, this um, guy right just here. Just math equation is sufficient. Yeah. Just want to see. But I do want to show. I, think, uh, I had this going. Is this one right here? Scenario. I think this is a scenario for the thing that will work, right? Let's give it a try. Yes. Now, it's going very slowly right now. I should point out to you, if you open the control panel on this, uh, that is, if you pause and open the controls and just diddle a little bit with this instead of having 60, I think that's what usually shows up there, you might want to, you know, make it faster or slower. Uh, that Let's will make it go a little bit uh, faster. Let's see the other way. Let's see. If, yeah, there we go. Okay, so th th this is, you know, typical speed. So here come the two waves, okay? One of them is going infinitely fast. Now, it doesn't look like that, but we're talking about zeros, right? That's what we're doing. We're factoring. We're factoring to get the zeros. And how fast do the zeros go to make these lines? Well, let me do sound effect. Bang! 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 Okay? In other words, for an instant there, it was everywhere. That's what it means to go infinitely fast. And that probably made a bang, right? Well, it didn't because there's zeros. Meanwhile, the other one that has slope zero isn't going anywhere. That's the group. Okay? That's the envelope. And that's so important, that whole idea of the uh, envelope which in radio engineering was called signal or in television or whatever, any sort of AM broadcast, uh, has this uh, envelope that's the uh, music, and inside that is something going uh, at megacycles or gigacycles or whatever uh, that uh, is the guts of the wave. That's the, uh, uh, the phase. The phase is the heartbeat of the wave. And it's a fast heartbeat, 91.3 megas. Megacycles for KUAF, right? So that's FM, but if AM uh, used to go up into the megacycles. Does that help at all? Um, so this is what we're looking at. Bang, bang, bang. We're making graph paper. Now what's going to happen when I run through that is that the bangs are going to slow down. They're not going to be infinitely fast, but they're still going to be faster than light. And the group wave, which is zero now, will be moving. Because you're moving. That's the relativity. So we're going to get all the equations of relativity in the next frame. Just doing this. That's all we're going to do. That's the math. that gives you the whole theory of relativity and everything goes past it. It's the geometry of equations like that. So it's very good that you asked that question, because I'm sure other people were wondering what the heck's going on here. This is a crucial point. Right here, making this thing now is pretty, this is pretty simple. I mean, that's a sophomore physics thing, a standing wave. But that's the way you should teach it. 
because it shows what's really happening. Now we're going we're gonna, to uh, Doppler shift this guy by a factor of two. That means we have to Doppler down by a factor of two. That's something that's a, 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 is described in the text a little bit longer. I'm not going to spend a, a time on that. But um, let's go ahead with this one where we've got the uh, thing Doppler shift. You see an ultraviolet, right? Uh, uh, from the way that he's running into it. He's running into Alice's and Carla's wave. Uh, it, was, it used to be 600 terahertz. It's going to be down in the infrared. It's going to be 300. So he's running into 1200 on this side and looks behind him and sees that light. It's going to be infrared. None of these are going to be visible to him. Okay, so that's, that's what we're doing with the graph paper here. Is the first thing I'm going to uh, ask you to do is draw a vector for a new first base that's twice as far Okay, so I want to see a um, arrow indicating the right thing that's really, really uh, fast. Okay, so I don't know what color to use. I think a blue will be appropriate since we're going to blue shift this thing clear up to past there. So we're going to get that thing going uh, that much K and frequency. It's 1200. So there's our vector R, right vector. Used to be first base down here. Now we've got a marathon run to first base. Okay, we're going to make the whole baseball diamond uh, do this. On the other side of this, using a, a red for infrared, I'm going to drop this thing uh, down to sort of erase it here and make it this long. Only that long. Okay, half is half of what it was uh, before. Uh, so now, instead of being 600 terahertz, it is in the infrared uh, at 300. So we'll put a letter L on that one. Then we're going to be interested in L plus R and L minus R, the vectors that go with that. Okay, so we're going to be eventually uh, drawing uh, the R vector, uh, the L vector again, but right here. From here to here. Now, I didn't warn you guys we're going to do a construction. I forgot to do that while I was forgetting the camera. Um, you don't really need it because you've got graph paper, but normally you would to uh, make the rest of this uh, that's going to be a parallelogram or a squished rectangle, uh, you would strike off an arc uh, on there uh, to make sure that you've got exactly this distance. And then you've got uh, your new second base. So your new second base uh, goes from uh, being uh, here. This is Pitcher's Mound, okay? And there's the, the uh, well, I shouldn't uh, say, but anyway, the second base is going to end up uh, right here. And then the Pitcher's Mound is going to be in the center of all of this. So then what you have to do is finish the baseball diamond. Uh, I'll just draw dotted lines for where it used to be. This was a, a run from second to third. Right there. This was the run from uh, first uh, to second, <coughs> which is shown uh, on the screen there pretty well. I'll just make some couple of lines to indicate where that used to be. But you're going to get a new pitcher's mound that's in the center of a rectangle that goes from here 45 degrees all the way down through the 600 terahertz uh, line there. So I'll go ahead and uh, put the blue uh, to work on that. I'll draw a blue line, and of course you don't have colored shocks, so we'll gussy it up later on. But um, there is the rest of the baseball diamond to third base. Third base is not down here a short steal from, from home base, okay? So all we need now is to find a ruler that's big enough to draw the diagonals, okay? There's one of them, and anybody wants a ruler, you've got plenty of them around here, but you, you should have. Uh, I've got to draw an X uh, there, okay? So. Um, let me get a longer ruler that doesn't have a magnet on it. 
I should be able to do the job with this one. You can set it on top of the other. <laughs> I can just set it, yeah, on top of that. Um, making sure that I get it right. <laughs> okay, so I'll put it uh, right there. It's going right through the L. Now I have to do is just drop it a little bit to be going through the R. Okay? So I'm going to draw that line. Now that vector is the one I'm going to want to come out of this origin, so we'll begin moving that shortly here. But uh, let's go finish uh, with sorry. Let's hit you with no, this deadly weapon. <laughs> okay, uh, here we go with the uh, rest of it. To find the new pitcher's mount. The new pitcher's mount is going to be happen to be right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Th this won't be for anything but this one uh, uh, octave uh, uh, case. So you need both lines in general when you are trying to find uh, the new uh, pitcher's mount. Okay, so there's P, this is P prime. All right, where's G? G used to be down here. I'm going to go ahead and draw that guy in as well. The G that was, uh, I'll take this thing away. The G that used to be length 2, pointing to there, it's going to move up. Okay. Now, an easy way to find that is just find the center of this guy right there. It's the same as the center of this square. Don't need a compass, but compass would be useful in general. Okay? So the G vector is going to come up uh, to there. Okay? So the G vector is going to go on a trajectory, which we're going to derive later on, just like this P vector went on a trajectory, which we'll derive later on. It comes in like that. By the way, that's a dispersion function for quantum mass. That's what we're making here. We're making an antimatter uh, dispersion relation uh, with this one. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this one as well. How do you find the second G? Say again. How do, did you find the second G? Um, using the graph paper, I just copied from this square right there. So visualize this square right here with the new pitcher's mound. And then just make sure you do the same thing on this side. That'll be G prime uh, right there. It's half the difference. Yeah, yeah right. This is the one that's half, half the difference. The other one's so the sum. It'll end right there. And then the, minus the, L. The, the, the blue guy right here just put a blue arrowhead on it just to indicate it, uh, is the uh, P prime, the new phase, and this is the new group uh, right there. Professor Harder? Yes. Uh, you haven't told us what are P and G are. P is? You haven't told us what are P and G are. Oh, okay. Let's, <laughs> um, one's the half difference and the other's the half sum. Let's go ahead. I'm going to uh, stop this particular uh, thing right here, and you know you should probably uh, pause before you uh, back out on your your browser. But I'm going to go ahead on this one uh, to the case where we take L and R and build P prime R plus L over two. So there's R, there's L, there's half their sum right there. Does that make sense? And then the half difference is just below there. And with the graph paper, it's, there's no graph paper here, so you would have to use a compass. But uh, with graph paper, you could find uh, the G prime. Okay? So here they are. And that finishes a parallelogram, actually a rhombus. So what we have just produced are the unit vectors that produce the Minkowski lattice. So remember, we're in per space time here. So we only do all of this stuff once. And then that gets propagated out into the uh, lattice that uh, Minkowski 
uh, would have discovered if he'd had a Macintosh and could animate uh, ways uh, the way we're doing it uh, right here. So here comes this um, infrared wave. That's the L prime coming leftward. And then here's that hot, really dangerous UV R prime. That's this guy uh, headed in the right direction, right hand direction. Okay, so there uh, is the, uh, the uh, um, picture uh, completed as far as we need uh, uh, right now. Uh, we now just have to figure out what the coordinates of these are, and we're done with relativity. That's it, as far as just simple relativity. Uh, but uh, let's get some other things uh, with it. So what I'm going to do uh, is real quick, I'm going to uh, run this animation right here that shows you this. And now you can see where the zeros, the cross zeros, are not infinitely fast anymore. And that's a first order relativistic effect that very few people get familiar with. These guys right here used to be infinitely fast. Now they're just faster than light, but they're, they're not infinitely fast. And you can see where it's cutting where the uh, real part is cutting the axis of, of the now line and making the white uh, lines that go this way. Meanwhile, because uh, uh, good old uh, Bob here is moving that way at a certain speed, which we're going to calculate now, uh, he's seeing things that used to be stationary uh, coming out here. He's seeing them moving this way. He's going that way. He sees them coming at him uh, pretty fast, not faster than light. We're going to figure out what that speed is, and we're also going to figure out what the other speed is just by looking at this graph. Okay? So the, think of this as a control panel. That's the Fourier space, the keyboard of the gods, okay? And we've got two dots going here that used to be here and here, and now we've taken that one down to here and that one up to there, and they're making uh, the framework of the Minkowski graph of space and time. Uh, for, well, how fast are we going? Let's see. That's the interesting thing here, is how fast are we going? Okay. Okay. I have yeah. a question. Wasn't Bob sitting still and measuring the... And then now he's moving. All Bob would be doing is taking, using CCDs uh, to find the zeros of the light that's coming from the two uh, lasers on either side of it. Yeah, but he's not moving, no? Well, it depends on who, who you say. Uh, in our frame, the frame where these lasers are, that's Alice and then Carla. <laughs> I haven't mentioned her much yet. Uh, in that frame, Okay. Uh, for those things, yeah. he's more he's, he's, I mean, now, let's, let's answer your question with what's coming, and then we'll come back uh, just a little bit more to the geometry here. Let me uh, point out this, what it really looks like, and here's the uh, arithmetic. But um, what I want to make a, f a point of, to, before we get too much into this graphics, and I thought I had it here. Um, let's see if I've got... I should have probably brought this up front right away. Uh, just, um, darn it, where did that go? Somehow I lost that. Um, that's weird. We lost a, a slide here that showed all of the situations that would make the graph that we're uh, talking about here. Let me see if it's back. Um, darn it, that's amazing. Ooh. Now the trouble is I had a cat in my office and every once in a while he'd walk on the keyboard and I think he did it in. That's too bad. <laughs> um, basically what I had showing, <laughs> this has wow. been a bad day, um, what I had showing was three cases. <coughs> One was Carl and uh, Alice with their lasers moving this way and Bob standing still. The second one that gives Bob the same thing is Carla and uh, Alice uh, standing still and Bob moving the, the other way toward Carla. Okay? 
those, both of those are horribly expensive in order to get um, either one of these cre uh, characters uh, moving at the speeds we're talking about here. And the speeds we're talking about here are, this is how fast what we're talking about here, three uh, uh, here, uh, <clears throat> one, two, three, two, five. We're talking about three-fifths, a little over half the speed of light, 0.6 speed of light. That's how much would it cost to get any of these characters going that fast? Well, basically, it'd be the gr gross national product of uh, three major, co the three largest companies, China and U.S. That's how much it would cost in energy just to get them up to that speed. The third way uh, to do this is practically free. Bob stands still, Alice stands still, and Carla stands still, and they, did, they tune their lasers up and down by factor of two, right? That's, that's the other way to do it. Have them make the color change, costs nothing. Now we've got a frame moving at three-fifths the speed of light, which he can look at. Assuming they adjust their intensities as well, there'd be no yes. to tell Good them. point. You've got to adjust everything with the Doppler uh, e to the rho, or minus rho, depending whether you're going up or down. You have to do that. Otherwise, we get a really crazy wave, which I call a galloping wave. And we'll look at that later on. You'll get a wave which does a Feynman Wheeler switchback. It goes forward in time, annihilates, and then shows up somewhere else created. Zeros and anti-zeros counteract. Uh, you, you, you have to see it to believe it. <laughs> okay. That's what happens to the coordinate system. It becomes a voided process. Okay, let's see if there's uh, anything else here that I can uh, point out to just help uh, with this. Um, let's go back on this one to the point where I'm talking about what you uh, already um, put on your graph paper, G prime and P prime, and the fact that they are half the sum. So this guy right here, G is over two, the difference, okay? The difference of R, the big R, minus the little L. Okay, that's that vector down there. Okay. And then the new pitcher's mound, this guy right here, I'll put it off from the side here. It's also a half sum. And it is a sum that uh, takes the sum of these two, literally. R, uh, that's this vector. I should use purple for that, but uh, good enough. Uh, R plus vector L. Okay. So what we're going to have to do is to get algebra going here is we're going to have to realize that this R vector here, and I, I should put a prime on it, okay, uh, as well as the P prime, okay, and I'll leave L and R alone, but it would really make this legal. I should put a prime on them because we've got um, R here that's green and L uh, here that's where it originally was. Okay, this is the old uh, R first base. This is the old L over here that's gone down here, and then this R has gone up to here to make R prime. Okay, does that that make sense so much so far? Okay. So what we have to do is realize that R prime is just. Uh, e to the rho uh, times r, the original r. And then that the uh, L prime down here is e to the minus rho uh, times, uh, I'll write it here, e to the minus rho uh, times the uh, old L. So this is the L prime. The new L is very short, half as short half as long, and this one is twice as long, okay? So, 
Uh, this is the Doppler factor right here. I guess it's appropriate for me to use the nice purple chalk that I've gone to the trouble of buying for all of this stuff. Uh, this is E to the purple row. We're talking about 1,200 terahertz uh, right here. And then uh, the, that is going to be adding over to uh, e to the minus rho. So you're going to get a hyperbolic cosine for this dimension right here. And then you're going to do the difference, okay, that'll be this distance right here, that'll be a hyperbolic sine. Those are the two coefficients of Lorentz transformation. Okay, so that's what's coming. I just want to make sure that you are uh, following this as best we can. Because uh, that arithmetic, that is, this arithmetic right here is the key thing. You've got a phase factor and you've got a group factor. And boy, is it complicated looking when you actually plot it. There's the group factor just cruising along at a nice sedate three-fifths the speed of light. And then there's this, this phase factor zooming along at five-thirds the speed of light. That's what we're going to find. Wow. This is, you know, this is a real um, mind blower in the sense that this thing is producing for us the, the uh, Lorentz contraction, this distance right here, between these uh, group lines, that, that is um, smaller than it used to be. And then the distance from the origin to there, that's higher than it was. That's called Einstein time dilation. But the m most obvious thing that's going on here is forward future, future past asymmetry. It used to be uh, past was behind the line and future was ahead of the line. Now Bob sees it the way Bob sees it is the future for Allison uh, is tipped over. So all of their future at that instant is above and all of their past is over here. You can look into their future by simply going over on this side and looking into their future. And that's a linear effect. These other things are second order. But this business of turning is first order. And relativity is the only subject that I know of where they consider the second order effects first, and at the very end of any description of relativity that I've seen, including what Einstein did, is the uh, first order effect, which is Doppler, and time asymmetry is talked about after you've gotten done with the second order. So you do the most mysterious ones first, and then you do the ones that look pretty obvious, really, uh, second. No wonder it is that people think relativity is a a, 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 a difficult subject. So here's the algebra, just to see what it is that we, we have here. Okay, we've got R prime, that's this guy right here, e to the row, e to the row, and L prime, plus e to the minus, minus it, L, okay, uh, there. So I've got a plus of these things, give me hyperbolic cosine, and then these guys are difference, that's hyperbolic sine. No imaginary numbers needed here. And uh, same thing down here, our minus L, they just flip. So this one gives us four, five fourths and three fourths. This one gives us three fourths and five fourths. That's Bob's view. This is Alice's view, and this is um, the um, other laser uh, in Alice's um, land. Uh, Carla's too, they're, they're, they're uh, co-moving. So that, that's it. That, that's the basic uh, stuff that we're going to work with and extend uh, that has a um, really tricky way uh, to get the uh, relativity uh, of factors. So I'm basically showing the L prime and the R prime uh, where they belong. And then this is their being put together. Now, um, this particular thing, the waves are actually being plotted at double scale, but this is showing a, a fairly complete uh, structure that um, 
you can draw after you've done this one. This is the um, keyboard over here. This is the control panel. There are only two points in it, right there and there, uh, that grew out of the two points that were uh, down on the axis here and here. Uh, they've come up traveling on a hyperbola, which is something we'll prove. That's why these are hyperbolic sines and hyperbolic cosines. They go with hyperbolas. But we've got a whole bunch of things that characterize the space-time, metrize the space and time with waves. We have the wavelength of the group. We have the wavelength of the phase. We have the period tau of the group. And we have the period tau of the phase. That's what makes relativity and quantum mechanics. And that's what we're going to be uh, wrestling with. Now, um, one thing that I should point out, and we've already pointed out, that the slope, that's the slope of this guy right here, if you read it off, 3 over 5, this is how fast Bob sees, uh, to answer your question, this is the one that Bob, by moving, sees this graph and he sees the, the uh, Alice coming at him at that speed. Then the waves inside are coming at him at a horrendous, a horrendous speed. Okay, we're talking about that speed right there, that speed right there. These two lines are parallel. Okay, this thing is going five-thirds the speed of light. It'll come out here and make a five-thirds instead of a three-fifths. So that, that's the basic idea, and I want to um, have you uh, study this uh, this weekend and see if you can do a construction like this without looking. But here's a table of all of the functions that um, we're talking about here, uh, including the ones of the stellar aberration angle, which we haven't mentioned yet. But here's the old-fashioned notation. Is there any... Um, you, you see this and you realize why people end up hating relativity because they had to work with horrible formulas like that. Using the relativity parameter, that thing that goes to 0.99999 in high energies. What a pain in the butt. That, uh, no, no wonder. This is the stuff that Einstein, by being a bigot, cut the whole world out of for a hundred years. Th th these are the key things uh, to, to make this stuff work. So all of these uh, wave parameters are, are, are nicely tabulated, and you can see them on the graph when you get done uh, at this three-fifths uh, thing here. They do weird things, and we don't need to talk about that so much. But I would like to point out that this is the property of a phase, the p slope here. That's that slope that's right here. It's fast, OK? It used to be infinitely fast, but now it's slowed down to a sedate five-thirds the speed of light. That's the lambda phase over tau phase uh, that's uh, there. And that's a, um, something that's really, really important, is that the heartbeat of a wave cannot go below the speed of light in this, in, in this model. So the, inside, the heartbeat of, a, of this wave is always faster than light, and sometimes infinitely fast, whereas the group uh, thing, and I think I should have had that uh, up there. Yeah, the group, okay, that, those lines are always slower. You will never see these uh, exceed the speed of light, no matter how much uh, you down-tune and up-tune uh, to lasers. Okay, so that is the important part of this. So here's where you just do a transformation from the infinitely fast to the uh, I'm sorry, infinitely fast to zero speed group and a uh, phase. And then when you look at it in space and time, these two vectors have flipped. And that's because this is reciprocal of the, of the uh, um, per space time. That's space time there with this uh, graph uh, filling up, you know, the whole, whole space time. So this is the Lorentz transformation right here in action. And the transformation matrix is just kosh, kosh, cinch, cinch. End of story. And it's uh, plus and minus of uh, e to the rows. Okay. So here's where uh, it is. 
this number called the Einstein time dilation uh, factor. Here it's up by 25%, 1.25. Here's the Lorentz contraction, that's the hyperbolic secant. It's down by 20%. Okay? That's easily seen with the, this graph that you've uh, made here already. So here's Mr. Einstein who said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I would say that's true of him, Mr. Bigot. I mean, if you just thought about waves a little bit, if you thought about what Michelson was doing in, at the University of Chicago, he could have come up with this wave uh, stuff very easily. Lorentz Links contraction. Okay, there he is. That's uh, in 1928 he died, but he was very active and did all kinds of things besides this. But that's the center of our table, right there. Those two. Those are the ones most, you teach sophomore physics about those. You don't get into these others that will really do things. That's, I think, important. Here's another way to look at time dilation by just drawing the graph in a funny way. But if you look at the graph, you see what it means to have a length of 2.0 show up, when you go up here, you can see where that is, it's 1.6. And you uh, would, would say, hey, wait a minute, how can that be? Because these guys say this one is 1.6. That's what these guys see for the lines, the red lines coming through, they see them at 1.6, but then the reverse is true too. So this is what I call a relativistic lover's quarrel. That is, one says, hey, your group wave is 20% short. It's, it's contracted. Okay, what's, what's the deal here? Uh, you guys, can't you work your lasers? But when they look, they look at what his looks like, says, no, Bob, you're the one with a short, shorty. Carl says, I agree with Alex. <laughs> That's really quite a paradox if you state it in classical terms. I mean, how can one person take a very accurate reading of some length and it, it disagrees, it, it, it comes out short, the other one says, no, you're the one that's short. How does that happen? Well, that's a wave trick. That's what quantum mechanics is, it's a wave trick. Here I resolve it. Okay. Let's just talk about the Doppler shift. We should have been talking, we, every time you do relativity, that's the first thing you should talk about. Alice, your laser, okay? 0.25 microns is 50% short. Well, yeah, of course. That's what lasers do, they Doppler shift. There's no paradox here. Why should there be one for the second order? There isn't. Now what's really screwy about this, you see, is what we've worked out here is that geometry rules, the Lorentz, Yubowski, you name it, uh, rules for the most ethereal thing that we know of that we can work with. That's light. And we're seeing that it contracts. That's wavelengths contraction going high frequency or expands, that's lowering, going red, okay, and say, yeah, I can, I, I can buy that. The Doppler diagram I showed you, pretty obvious. Yeah. But the second order effects, what about them? Okay, what about them? Okay. Everyone that works in a laser lab knows that you really have to be careful when you set up your Envir steel tables that you keep the wavelength, the, the length of the cavity unchanged. So the question then is, when Alice looks at that wave, and suppose that wave was actually being produced right in her cavity, does that invar steel, is it really invar, invariant, right? And Bob would say, your invar steel got, got short too. It had to in order to keep that wave resonant, exactly. 
that's the proof of the pudding right there, that the Invar steel has quantum waves in it that are doing exactly the same kind of contraction as the light waves, the ethereal light waves. The Invar steel is also ethereal. It just doesn't look that because we never get going that fast. Three fifths of speed of light. That, I mean, that's around the world like that in, uh, four or five times, right, in one second. It's incredible speed. And that's when the quantum mechanics shows on everything. Now you see that everything is made out of a, what's called matter wave. But the matter waves, as we're going to demonstrate more or less indirectly, are light waves too. They behave like light waves in many ways. And I'll leave you with that thought. And I'm sorry for being late for forgetting the light capturer here, but uh, I think it's worth it. This is stuff that you can think about and work out new ideas just lying in bed. Stop light. Just out of curiosity, did you mention that typo that we've noticed? Here, I've got 